Since remotest antiquity, man has tried to speak to his gods through symbols. One could place a gift before an altar, a sacred object, the dwelling place of any of the nearby deities. But how might one reach aloft to the heavens, to the distant gods of the moon, the stars, and the sun? In the Western Hemisphere, long before the arrival of the white man, smoke from burning herbs ascended to the heavens, carrying with it the prayers and the desires of the Indian. What he could not touch with his hand, he sought to reach with incense, and the smoke itself was believed to have mystical powers of protection and healing. The ceremonial altars in which tobacco and certain other herbs were burned took many forms. The most primitive container was probably a simple concave stone or a depression in the ground made by removing the turf so that the virgin soil was exposed. Incense was also formed by puffing on hollow tubes filled with burning tobacco. At some point in time, now lost to history, a hollow shaft and a stone bowl were fitted together to form a simple pipe. The importance of the pipe in the ritual life of the Indian is revealed in the legends handed down from generation to generation, as in this Plains Indian story about the origin of the first pipe. One day, as two men were hunting on the prairie, a beautiful woman dressed in white buckskin appeared before them and said she had come to talk to their chief standing hollow horn. When all the people had gathered in a great lodge, the sacred woman entered, walked sunwise around the lodge, and stood before the chief. Holding up a bundle, she told him she bore a gift from the great spirit. Then, as all eyes watched her, she untied the bundle and drew forth a magnificent pipe. Its bowl was of red stone and symbolized their mother, the earth. Carved in the stone was a buffalo calf, which stood for all of the four-legged animals who lived upon the earth. The wooden stem represented all that grew on the earth, and the twelve hanging feathers, the winged things in the skies. The woman warned Standing Hollowhorn to treasure this sacred gift, because it stood for all the people and all the things in the universe. Each of their voices would join his when he offered up incense to the Great Spirit and with this pipe his people would prosper. Then, walking sunwise around the fire, she left. But after going a short distance, the woman looked back and sat down. And when she stood up, a cry of surprise was heard, for she had turned into a red and brown buffalo calf. The calf walked farther away, rolled over, and stared at the people. When it stood up, it became a white buffalo, Walking off toward the horizon, it again lay down and arose, this time all black in color. Then, bowing to each of the four corners of the universe, the buffalo disappeared beyond a hill. From this mythical beginning, smoking was to spread to the far corners of the earth. But unlike those who later adopted the custom, the Aboriginal American never smoked for his own personal pleasure. Of the many types of pipes made by the Indian, none was more sacred than the calumet. Carefully fashioned after that first legendary pipe, it played an important role in many community functions. It was used to bring needed rain or favorable weather for a journey. It gave safe conduct to travelers. It served to formalize agreements, to placate hostile tribes, and to conclude a lasting peace. The word calumet is Norman French for tube or flute, particularly a shepherd's pipe. It originally referred to a highly symbolic reed shaft through which the life spirit of man was said to pass. When the French explorers first saw the ornate wooden pipe stems in America, they used this same term to describe the Indian's ceremonial pipe. 
In smoking the calumet together, the parties to a pact invoked the sun and the other major deities as witnesses, and the pact could not be violated without incurring the wrath of the gods. The most prized of the calumets had bowls of soft red stone found only in a few parts of the north central United States. More than a century ago, the American painter George Kaplan visited the great quarry in Minnesota. The mineral was later named Kaplanite after the artist who had spent so many years among the Indians. His impression of the area was recorded on a page in his sketchbook. In 1840, nearly 6,000 tribesmen were said to have been camped around the quarry, and Longfellow would later write of this place in Hiawatha, telling how the Great Spirit instructed his people to make the first peace pipe. Now a small national monument of 283 acres, it stands apart from the surrounding countryside, guarded by the spirits of three young women said to have been buried beneath the great boulders which mark the quarry entrance. Before Kaplanite could be removed from this hallowed ground, a sacrifice of tobacco had to be made to the three maidens. That tradition is still followed by Indians who come in quest of the stone. Men of the Sioux, the Mandan, and the Blackfoot, the Ojibwe, the Ponca, and others. For 300 years and more, Indians of the plains have stood before these boulders and sought permission to enter. Even at the most accessible points, the red pipe stone is buried beneath a layer of quartzite, five to eight feet thick. To reach the Kaplanite, this protective rock must be penetrated. In the past, this was sometimes done by building bonfires atop the quartzite ledge, and then dashing cold water on the heated stones. The fractured rocks would then be broken away with stone mauls, or shattered by other methods. In spite of the passage of time, many of the old ways remain. Originally, the pipe stone was a clay-like substance, sandwiched between massive layers of sandstone. The great weight of the overlying rock, accompanied by the heat and the chemical action, slowly altered the composition of the minerals, fusing the sandstone into quartzite and the clay into a layer of red steatite less than a foot thick. As the surface of the earth shifted, cracks opened in the quartzite, and it was here, in these fissures, that the Indian's eye first fell upon the material he would fashion into his incense altar. The Kaplanite slabs were pried loose from the rock bed, lifted to the surface, and examined for flaws. Then, in a pattern little changed with the passage of time, an ancient and arduous process began. Even before the advent of the pipe, tobacco served in many ways as a link with the spirit world. It was the principal medium through which the priests and medicine men received their inspiration. Among other things, powdered tobacco leaves were used in the treatment of headache, lockjaw, obstructions of the kidney, diseases of the heart, and poisoning from arrows or snake bites. Offerings of tobacco in a dry state appear to have been made mostly to inanimate objects near at hand, to caves or mountains, to odd-shaped rocks or tree trunks. Anything that excited the curiosity or superstition of the Indian might be the dwelling place of a spirit. It is believed that most such sacrifices related to the Indian's worldly success rather than his future life. They were made not as an atonement for sin, but rather to obtain some advantage over others or to avert the anger of the spirits. Dry tobacco would be sprinkled on the earth before crops were planted. It might be cast upon the grave mound of one who now lived among the spirits or be sent as a token of friendship to a person in another tribe. In contrast to the dry tobacco sacrifice, burning leaves had an other world quality. 
The smoke was real, yet intangible. Something that could be seen, but which was not really there at all. Smoke from the incense altar became a symbol of the supernatural, an embodiment of the spirits vested with many of their powers. When a member of the Hidatsa tribe was suffering from a pain, he simply placed his pipe upon the afflicted region and puffed on it vigorously. In that way, he believed he could extract the disease from his body. When he blew the smoke from his mouth, he would try to catch it with his hands and throw it into the fire so that it couldn't contaminate anyone else with the illness. As the Indian closed his eyes and filled his lungs with smoke, the fumes of the smoldering tobacco would sometimes overpower the senses and render the smoker unconscious. The human and the spirit world would then merge into one. It was in that state that many Indians received visions and had dreams which bore messages from the gods. For centuries, access to the few available deposits was unhampered. Craftsmen of many tribes traveled as much as a thousand miles from their homes in neighboring territory to mine material for their altars. The quarry was regarded as common property, and even the bitterest of enemies abstained from hostilities while they camped within these grounds. But by the mid-19th century, this age-old pattern had changed. The Dakota Sioux proclaimed the site to be exclusively theirs, and at one time a part of the region was set aside for their use when they ceded other lands in the vicinity. Between 1865 and 6, white men of the Northwestern Fur Company also worked this quarry and made over 2,000 pipes, which were traded to tribes in the southeast and the far west. Today, Indians from all parts of the country may come here, but removal of the stone by white men is prohibited. When first quarried, catlinite is relatively soft and easily worked, though it hardens with exposure to the atmosphere. As seen here, the outside of the pipe bowl required little in the way of specialized tools. The relatively soft catlinite was easily scraped away with quartzite saw blades or worn down by the hard surfaces of the grinding stones. But the drilling of the bowl cavities demanded the greatest of skill and patience on the part of the pipe maker. For this, a different set of stone tools was required. The first was generally made of chert, very slim, expanded at the base so as to serve as a flat handle. A second drill of greater diameter was used to enlarge the opening. Finally, a hafted drill left the hole circular and smooth. When the proper depth was attained, the entire task had to be repeated, this time in the bowl section of the pipe. In some pipes of stone or pottery, Six or eight stem holes might be made in a single bowl. In that way, a number of the tribe's headmen could share in the smoking simultaneously, each puffing on the common bowl with his own private pipe stem. As the drilling progressed, frequent measurements were made since the two holes had to meet at precisely the right point in the elbow. An error in judgment here could mean the loss of an entire day's work. Finally, the telltale puff of dust. The L-shaped tunnel is completed. The drilling has been done well, and the pipe will now draw freely. The final touch, a distinguishing mark of the Catlinite pipe bowl. When dressed with a coating of buffalo tallow, the bowls took on a strikingly different appearance. But for all of their brilliance, these Catlinite bowls were no more resplendent than the pipe stems accompanying them. From two to five feet in length, the sanctity of the pipe lay as much in its wooden stem as in the bowl itself. In fact, for certain purposes, the stem alone was used. Covered with elaborate wrappings, decked with eagle feathers, paint and cords of braided porcupine quills, the ornaments represented some of the objects which had symbolic meaning in the ritual. The Plains tribes 
often bound to the stem several woodpecker heads with the beaks turned back upon their red crests. When the woodpecker was angry, its red crest always rose, and this binding of the beak upon the crest symbolized the suppression of anger. When a tribe was at war, the sinew bindings were cut, allowing the crests of the birds to rise from the pipe stem. When not in use, the bowl was carefully wrapped and placed inside a pipe bundle, while the ornate stem was usually tied to the outside of the bundle. The limb from which a stem would be made was cut from a sapling, usually of ash. It was then heated over a fire, straightened, and cut to the required length. With some tribes, this distance was carefully measured off as four times the span between the thumb and the longest finger. The limb was then split down the middle and the exposed pith scraped out of the center to form a channel through which the smoke might pass. At one time, the tradition of some tribes dictated that even the inside surfaces of the branch be ceremonially painted. With the exception of the groove itself, one half would be made a sky blue color and the other half a verdant green of the earth. Then, as a prayer was intoned, asking that life be breathed into this sacred object, the chief priest would paint the grooves red to typify the passageways of the body through which the breath of man comes and departs. When the two halves were glued together again, they symbolized the path of man's life surrounded by the spirits of heaven and earth. But the split stem seen being assembled here was not always satisfactory. With age, the halves sometimes warped and separated. The characteristic flat shape of the finished stem may have evolved in an effort to provide a broader gluing surface where the halves of the stem were joined together. Later, when metal became available, a heated wire was used to burn a channel down the center of the stem without ever splitting it. But even before that time, some ingenious tribes devised their own answer to the problem. They would find a wood boring grub which they placed in one end of the limb. They then heated that portion over a fire. Following a path of least resistance, the grub would eat its way up through the soft pith in the center, leaving behind it a hole from one end of the limb to the other. Before a pipe could be used in any ceremony, it had to be consecrated. Wrapped in fresh sage, it was placed before an elder whose task it was to prepare the altar for the sacred role it would be called upon to play. Filling the first pipe full of tobacco was a delicate operation. A man was forbidden to pack the tobacco down with his fingers, lest the gods take his life in the belief that he was offering himself along with the tobacco as a sacrifice. The first pipe was therefore frequently tamped with a broken arrow captured from an enemy warrior. The solemn rite being performed by this Sioux priest had its origin generations ago. Yet in essence, its meaning is strangely similar to prayers heard elsewhere in other tongues. Expressions of gratitude to the sun because it gave them light, to the moon because she was believed to influence vegetation, to the earth because it gave them support, to the fire because of its benefit in cooking, to the evil spirits to appease their anger, and to the good spirits for providing all things needed in this lifetime. It is difficult now to realize that this predecessor of the modern pipe once represented a significant advance in the religious development of the American Indian. Yet the Indian's calumet was such a milestone. For the earliest inhabitants of this continent, tobacco was a plant of divine origin. Its transformation into incense provided a path along which prayers might find their way to the beings beyond, a visible messenger to the invisible, to the unseen forces that would shape their destiny and dictate their actions. Bathe now in the stream before you. Wash the war paint from your faces. Wash the blood stains from your fingers and bury your war clubs and your weapons. Break the red stones from this quarry. Mold and make it into peace pipes. 
Take the leaves that grow beside you. Deck them with your brightest feathers. Smoke the calumet together. And as brothers, live henceforward. In the centuries that separate modern man from his forebears, there is much that he has forgotten.